I recently presented at a learning design conference and the title of my presentation was The High, the Low and the Fuzzy, How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Design Thinking Collaborations. Now in the presentation, I explored different approaches that learning designers use in design thinking workshops, for example. And then the focus of the presentation was about um, some of the shortcomings or obstacles that might present themselves on a very practical level um, related to not getting the most out of design thinking um, processes. And uh, I found I ran out of time in the presentation. So what I did is I recorded what I could and then after the fact I just tacked on a little bit on the end to just cover the slides that I didn't have time to cover in the actual presentation. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. Okay, now I've got the signal. Uh, hello everyone, um, my name is Mark Parry. I'm, I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, this is my presentation, The High, the Low and the Fuzzy, How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Design Thinking Collaborations. Now we've had a few um, instances, a few of the speakers this morning have been talking about design thinking. Um, and so my presentation is not so much about the processes of design thinking, it's more looking at design thinking in a broader context. When design thinking goes bad is what I would tell people in corridors. Um, this is an outline of my presentation. It's basically what's written in the, in the guide. There's a bit of a weird delay for me, so I'm gonna press my <laughs> slide and then that sort of thing happens. So um, bear with us. Just a little bit of background. Um, I'm from the Australian Film, Television and Radio School, which is a Commonwealth Government Agency. And so we're in Moore Park and we teach um, content and, well, teach, um, classes related to film, television, radio, digital, media, communication, storytelling, and creativity. Um, the main focus of the school is the BA and the master's program. However, as the next slide will reveal, um, I am in an area uh, where we offer short courses. So we call them industry certificates. And there's a URL if you want to check out some examples. So they're practical industry skills. They're typically 12 weeks or eight weeks. Um, they're really, typically they're blended courses and they're generally run by industry practitioners. So being the learning designer, I partner with um, industry um, practitioners to develop the courses, to design the curriculum, and then to, to put, all, we work in Moodle, Moodle LMS. Um, and make it happen. So uh, another part of what we offer is corporate, so corporate training. Uh, so things like, as the slide will reveal, uh, storytelling for business, as well as presentation skills. Um, you might recognize that person on the right from Australian television. So some of these are just one day courses, that sort of thing. So there's a bit of a range. So it's quite an interesting, for me as a learning designer, it's an interesting, situation or context um, because it's highly specific um, in its um, where it, how it's situated and so a little bit more about me uh, as I said my name is Mark Perry I started my working life in 1990 just, just bear with us wait for the slide um, and I originally am a science teacher in high school so I've worked across kindergarten to year 12 and I've also worked across, I'm a very patient person. <laughs> I've also worked across, uh, <laughs> here we go, um, vocational and TAFE. We saw it for a little minute there. Here we go. Um, vocational TAFE, I've met a few TAFE people here this morning. So that's always nice. I've got a soft spot for uh, observable evidence from learners. Um, and so sometimes that's fleeting in a, in a media creative uh, school. It's hard to kind of quantify some of those learning outcomes. Anyway, I've also had dealings with corporate training, staff to de uh, professional development, uh, higher education, such as universities, um, the nonprofit sector. So essentially as a freelancer, uh, which I do bits and pieces, um, even though I'm full-time at the film school, I do video production, learning design, and educational consulting. 
Now the next slide has lots of logos on it. They're different clients and workplaces that I've um, had dealings with over the last 15 years. And so the, the stories that I will be outlining in my presentation are based on all of these uh, organisations. So I'm, I'm not going to identify anyone or any, any particular organisation, but it's basically what I've observed. As somebody said this morning, design thinking is not a new thing. If, you, if you've been an instructional designer for a while, these are the kind of techniques that you should be very familiar with already. And so a lot of my stories are drawn from say 15 years ago type thing and more recent as well. So this is, this is kind of a, just the wide range of different organisations that I've had dealings with. So I've got a quote from Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, um, about design thinking. Design thinking is, is a human-centred approach to innovation that draws from the designer's cool toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements of, for business success. So that's basically if people are not familiar with this idea of design thinking. Now this next slide, I can see I've got a series of checklists, uh, check boxes. Um, I figured that the, the participants that are in the room today, if you could complete the following sentence, just um, design thinking. If you have heard of this phrase, participated in a workshop, design thinking workshop, designed and developed programs, maybe you've develop, d developed, uh, sorry, delivered design thinking workshops, maybe you've reviewed and critiqued, or none of the above. Now I've made a few assumptions and, oh, those ticks came in quickly. <laughs> oh, that's because it's technically it's the same slide with an animation. Anyway, um, so how many people agree with the ticks generally? Is there anybody that would tick that bottom box? Okay, I have a special prize. The good people from the Afters Marketing Department. <laughs> Here's a little show bag. There you go. Because <laughs> I guess with any good story or any good piece of learning is to know your audience. So I'd made, I've made an assumption that most of the people in the room, I'm not going to bore you with the details of what design uh, thinking is. So I'm just going to rush through for those for you. <laughs> um, there's lots of post-it notes generally, lots of sticky notes. Um, that's right. Lots of kind of filling in boxes, terms like ideation, personas, challenges, solutions, prototypes, that sort of thing. Um, building towards a purpose, uh, um, getting into uh, what, what are you designing? And so I thought I'd just look very briefly at a few uh, objects that are designed. So designing with purpose, I figured, well, the ultimate uh, object is a light bulb. It's even a symbol. It's a visual motif for um, designing or t for thinking. And so without going into all the detail about LED light bulbs, the question is, why do we need this? Okay, what's its purpose? So, if I press that now, we'll just, the next example is a cattle pen. I'm not sure if people are, are familiar with somebody called Temple Grandin. So she designed a cattle pen. Again, it's the same question, why do we need this? Cattle were getting stressed. <coughs> cattle that are stressed, that's not a good thing for the cattle or for the owners of the cattle. And so, Temple Grandin designed a cattle pen that's curved. So the cattle are not stressed. That's the simple version, but you can find out more about that um, with that URL or just Googling Temple Grandin. Again, it's this idea that design doesn't come out of nowhere. And I guess underpinning all of this is learning design. This is where we're heading. This is the tube map. Somebody sat down, possibly a team of people. They wrote, uh, they um, wanted to communicate why do we need this? We need to communicate all the, the different stops. A geographical map is too complicated. So they, they started to look at it in a slightly different way. So this is a design classic, the tube map. 
So we can learn from that as learning designers because typically some learning designers um, design curriculum and other learning designers, they're more nuts and bolts developers, that sort of thing. But why do we need this? We're engaging with things like learning needs or training needs, the workplace context, uh, all these other elements. So it's kind of um, this, this broad notion that within a design system, you're engaging with the elements. And as a first step, it does get a lot more complicated. So here's my, my schema. Because often I meet people in corridors and they say, wow, with, with open eyes, a learning designer, like a real live learning designer. And then what, what exactly does that, what do you do? I don't know what you do. I don't know what that is even. And so I drew up this uh, about six months ago. So the, the, the images on the left, um, typically, training is conceived as a fireside chat, especially training from industry professionals. And so, and there's a fireside chat with other resources like readings or other things they're drawing upon. There's a little face-to-face -face moment happening um, on, the, on the whiteboard. So when we're trans transforming that into blended learning, we've got to learn a pathway and we might be tracking their journey. So. This is, I find this one image is a good starting point to explaining what, what learning design is and what's the purpose of it, why do we need it, and getting um, the SMEs on board. And so I've got a few other examples of designing with purpose. Um, educators use design thinking. There's even dedicated websites, again, by, uh, developed by IDEO and other organisations about how you might use these sort of systems. There's also a model, maybe some of you are familiar with it, uh, called ADCAR, it's a change management model for organisations. And so there's lots of design elements within such a, a system. And again, if you're interested, you can, you can Google that. But I just wanted to introduce my presentation by just uh, exploring where we're at. What is design and why do we need it? And so a few people have mentioned this morning about agile, the agile processes. Um, and there's a, a, a definition, so we're not gonna dwell on any of these. Back to IDEO. So IDEO did not invent design thinking, but we have become known for practicing it and applying it to solving problems, small and large. So another, another example is, um, De Bono's thinking system, the, the six thinking hats people might be familiar with. And those colors are going to, there they are. So basically there's a, it's a process involved where there's um, a white hat and there's a red hat that signifies feelings. So again, just, just look this up afterwards. But yeah, I use this quite a lot if I'm teaching classes because I find that it, it rings true and it, it, involve, it, it allows creative thinking within a sensible framework. There's also mind mapping. I don't suppose there's any primary school teachers in the audience, but if there were, mind mapping is not a new thing. The primary school teachers have been using mind mapping for a very long time. So it's, it's good to see that corporations and design thinking processes are also in, are using things like mind mapping or brainstorming, whatever you want to call it. When it emerges, there it is. So, Oh, that, that came across really, this is a little pause moment, okay? So we should be about one third of the way through, one third of the way through my presentation. So that's just to define where we're at in terms of design. So with design thinking, it's great when it happens and it's all good, okay? That really starts to solve our problem, put me down for some further action and follow up. Of course, people, you know, a diligent person might say, and people's minds can be blown by the process because you're getting all these ideas generated. And that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. It justifies the use of these processes. So two examples that I just want to touch upon. One was with the ABC several years ago. They, use, they have a hackathon, a two days of design thinking, and they have it as part of a structured process. And then they even have prizes at the end, most immediately usable idea. So they get all their back-end tech people to work in teams, that sort of thing. 
Um, the, the example on the right is from Macquarie University. They have a uh, learning design process called DDI. So they use that with their, with their academics. And um, they kind of, it generates lots of design thinking that's related to um, building online courses. So well done us is, is, you know, if it's all good. However, the focus of the presentation is not all good. It's when things start to go a little bit bad or, you know, might have, there's some obstacles in the way. This is an obstacle. This is a, a, a temporal obstacle for me. Okay, so problem number one I have observed over the years is fumbling the process. Okay, so you can see by my little emojis that I've used, um, used a lot. I, I can only stay for a few minutes. I have meetings all day. So if, you've, if you've, you're a learning design team and everyone's gathered and then one of the participants says, well, I can only stay, it's like, well, what's the point? You don't wanna, if they're a colleague, you don't wanna kind of get too angry. Maybe there's very good reasons. However, it's kind of a, an acknowledgement that right from the get-go, the, the process can be fumbled. Okay, I've got a few quotes. Uh, I'll just start reading them. You, they'll, they'll be here in a minute. We only have seven minutes for this phase before we need to move on. I like that idea because it's the one my manager suggested. That might be familiar to people. Um, so let's just pick an idea and go with it. I like yellow post-it notes, so this one's it. So it's, in other words, people are not focused on the, the ideas that are generated. So that, again, the, the, the process is fumbled. So how do you solve this? So you might set appropriate expectations of the participants. You might allocate appropriate time for activities. You might have clear and achievable goals and parameters. You might rehearse complex workshop activities, anticipate the time required, including transitions between activities. The fact that today there's a little five or 10 minute buffer between the presentations, that type of thing is really, really sensible. So if you've got a professional development day and you don't have those little things, then it can start to um, impact upon the, the activities that you've planned. Um, and Plan the processes involved, that is the activities within the workshop, but also coming up with an action plan. Now, my next problem is what I've called training fatigue, and the quote is just a simple yawn. It's going to arrive in a minute. There he is. So, people kind of sometimes hear, maybe there's people in this room that have gone to design workshops many, several times, and you know, so, and also within a training schedule or calendar, sometimes there's too much training. People don't have enough time. People don't always value, I know it's hard to, you know, think of, but people don't always value training. So they might say things like, we don't have time for silly sticky notes. And this sort of nonsense is a real waste of time they might consider them to be Mickey Mouse activities, especially in a corporate environment where they might not be used to this type of thing. So how do you solve that? If you show respect to the participants and their perspectives, uh, this idea of empathy, I mean, that's a bit of a loaded term already, but good old fashioned empathy goes a long way, just in terms of where are your learners at? What are they feeling? Uh, what's gonna annoy them? What's gonna make them feel better? Uh, Welcome the participants to engage with a holistic process. Clarify the situation and the various points of view. You might acknowledge the shortcomings and limitations of the, of the session. And it's always important to acknowledge the context. Now, another completely unexpected uh, phenomenon that I've observed a few times in different organisations is this idea of infatuation or infatuated and elated. And there's a quote, but we designed the whole course to be completely unstructured. Students just need, uh, just do what they feel like. So this was a real example of a very specific, they got all these stakeholders to come together to design a, an online course for a particular outcome. And then we'd gone through several processes and then the crunch time came, this is like several months into the process and then 
the, the participants were um, so in love with the design thinking processes, they had actually lost sight of what was the purpose? Why were they here? So here's some quotes. Empathy mapping, love, love, love. I'm not sure if that's an actual quote. It's gonna be here in a minute, so there. But um, I wanna put all the sticky notes on all the walls. Like I say, they, they get right into the processes and you, you don't wanna put a wet blanket over that. However, it's a little bit tedious from a, maybe I'm getting older, but it's a little bit tedious when you see all this sparkle happen and then you get something like, oh, but oh, we just don't wanna use an LMS. It's like, well, guys, the, didn't your leader or manager not point this out to you about six months ago? And so how do you solve that sort of situation of being having your team members infatuated by the process? So if you can, again, acknowledge the context and purpose of the workshop, you might temper blue sky enthusiasm with some of the practicalities. Strong leadership is a really good thing in this situation. Uh, you, and that strong leader might articulate their vision and purpose of the, of the workshop. Outlining some ground rules, some base understandings, and some parameters such as what LMS platforms and other technology will you be using or likely to be using? Sometimes that's not negotiable. And so it's kind of, it's good to have that up front if it's not negotiable. Um, Timeframes and budgets and other workplace project frameworks. Now here's one I definitely have observed and I, this is lame is my quote. There he is. <laughs> I'm glad I got a laugh for that. So I hate group work. Are we having fun yet? What's with all these silly sticky, sticky notes? Very cute. So sometimes not everyone likes this kind of territory and they may be participants within your workshop. And so what do you do? So here are some suggestions. You might reassess the participant list. That's a nice way of saying something. <laughs> you might emphasize the willingness to engage with people who have a different perspective. Um, you might engage with deeper processes such as the processes of managing change. Um, always keep in mind that naysayers can often teach us new ways forward and point out the obstacles in our path. So I guess everyone has a contribution. It's about managing the process. Um, where are we? A pragmatic approach to the outcome, multiple approaches to solutions, um, and then this idea of qualitative versus quantitative. Um, no, a little bit of wiggle room in other words. So here's another problem. I've just got a whole endless problems. Been there, done that is one of the problems. Now this is based on a, uh, a real example again. These blank strips are extras and they need to be thrown out. I was in a situation where I was diligently managing my learning resources for the session and I had my pieces of paper to work with the, the team members and there were deliberately blanks in there so the team members could bring their own ideas in and write them down because I, I didn't know, I couldn't second guess all of the solutions. And somebody threw out the blanks. Oh yes, I'll help you, Mark. Threw them away because they just made the, the assumption. They'd, they'd run learning, uh, learning design, design thinking workshops many, many times. So they just kind of thought, oh, well, yeah, we know what's going on. And so I was most annoyed, so annoyed I have incorporated their behavior into my slide. So here's some quotes. They're gonna arrive soon, really, again. Uh, is one, one of the things. I already know all about design workshops. I've even delivered one. This will be my fifth design workshop this year. So again, this is acknowledging, I figured all of you guys are across this territory, being, you know, coming to a, a learning design conference. So how do you solve that? Again, you might wanna reassess the participant list. Uh, you might wanna raise awareness of the actual issues to be solved. You might re remind participants that the workshop structure might be familiar, but the processes and outcomes are the real focus. And they, they might be new to them and to trust the process. You can incorporate input 
from the participants. Um, I'll place all these slides on my website at some point if people want to tap into them. Because yeah, this tech, tech issue was not anticipated. Um, you might want to incorporate strategies that empower and motivate participants. Uh, activities that allow participants to vent and explore frustrations without significantly hijacking the event. Uh, and an open and transparent approach to the workshop and its um, purpose. I think this is my last problem and it's indifference and apathy. So that workshop was just something we did for an afternoon. Not sure what we're meant to do now. This is maybe a corridor conversation. Is that uh, two minute, two minute wrap it up or? Okay, I'm going to race through these. Says I. Okay, so there's, there's some quotes or typical responses uh, that are not particularly positive. And then how do you solve that? You can clarify tangible positive outcomes. You might add in an enticement, that might be appropriate. You can get buy-in. Um, engage, get buy-in from your stakeholders, um, establish trust, and then significantly you can have an action plan. Now, I've only, I feel as though I'm only two thirds of the way through my presentation. However, I think I have summarized um, all of this on one single slide. So I don't think I'm gonna go into the detail. This is a little, this is an emotional pause, mainly for me. Given the circumstances, I'm glad I've incorporated this. So I'll just read these out. Design thinking, if you can frame it. So number one is to nurturing and encourage creative and design thinking, which is definitely in the spirit of the design thinking ideology. But also to identify the aims and the purpose of the workshop, key word being purpose. Who is the audience and why are they attending? Um, how will you document and consolidate findings and outcomes? As in, get, get things written down. All those giant post-it notes, somebody has to write that up. And so if that's not organised beforehand, it can be easier to just shove it into the cupboard and then, oh, thank goodness that's all over, let's get back to work. But, you know, I guess it's a, an acknowledgement of what, why you're doing the, the workshop in the first place. Um, how will the findings and outcomes be used and as somebody said this morning back in the olden days or you know if you're a learning designer or an instructional designer that analysis phase is so crucial that's when you use these sort of workshops and you write everything down and then that can become your your statement of work or your business plan or your uh, scoping document so it's it's using all of that data that's generated yes Yep, Addy model. Yeah, there's some lovely um, little exercises from the IEO website, that sort of thing. Um, are there specific ones that you find suit different steps of the Addy model better? Um, so yes. That? Yes. I'll, I've got a slide on that. That's, um, I'm just going to skip through until I'm told to get off. Um, create an action plan. So here, my next slide, number one is timing and context. And here is that familiar ADDIE model, A-D-D-I-E. It's coming in a minute, it's gonna roll in. And so design thinking activities usually belong nice and early in the process. There it is. So if you're strategic about the timing, it's probably not a good idea to use these sort of workshops when you're implementing. And I mean, I know from personal experience, but it, it's kind of like this idea that you used to have this much time to develop, now you seem to, these time frames seem to be really, really compressed. And so it's a little bit frustrating if you're doing all this design thinking and blue sky, wow, how's it gonna be? Let's draw upon everyone's thoughts, but then you're already in the devel development and delivery phase it becomes almost impossible, really frustrating to implement. So definitely in the analysis phase, but also part of the design phase because it is iterative and it, it, these phases are sometimes fluid. 
Um, I've got a bad situation. Scheduling a design workshop at a random date with no relation to workshop or project schedules or any sort of underlying strategy. So does this sort of acknowledge what you what you were asking or Well, yeah, I guess you just build in a proof of concept with it, which is a prototype. If you just have something that's not made out of cardboard, something that's actually going to work and using the tools that you, this is where an LMS might come in. If you know your LMS and you've got some, some good people that can build something for you, then you can make that proof of concept an actual working proof of concept that can be trialed and tested. I've found that can be enormously reassuring for managers because they can get conversations happening directly with stakeholders that can then, oh, okay, we've got one, one of 12 things built now, let's just tune out the rest. So that, that might be a strategy that works. We've got some crowds at the door. I'm not sure we're going to have, maybe we can have one more question if people have a question, because I think I'm going to have to wrap it up. But again, I'll, I'll put these the whole suite of slides, um, maybe I'll add a little bit at the end um, onto my website if you want to check it out. So th thanks guys. So number two is why bother? Again, why are you doing the design thinking activity? What's its purpose within a broader context? what is the overall objective of the learning resource or, or whatever else you're using the design thinking workshop for. Uh, also, you might want to think about what are the advantages for the learners, for management, for stakeholders, and for the broader organization. And a bad situation that I've got an example of is running a workshop and getting too caught up in the color and movement and then forgetting its initial purpose. So number three, who are you going to call? So who is involved in the process? Who is invited to participate in the design thinking activity? What is their role and how will they contribute? Now, I have two bad situations. Uh, one of them is when participants are in the design workshop but don't have much influence to follow up or implement their findings. And another bad situation is when you are needing crucial input and buy-in from a workforce sector or group of key stakeholders and then not inviting them. So again, this taps into who's in, the, who's in the room and who is participating. Number four, think about the group dynamics. So how do you get the most from the groups and what are some preferred learning styles within the groups? So I've got a list of uh, different preferred learning styles, visual, oral, verbal, physical, logical, social, and solitary. And so if you've got an idea as to how the comfort factor of the, the participants, then you can strategically um, uh, group people together or make them work on separate areas so that you get the most out of the situation. Uh, a bad situation is, for example, participants who prefer a solitary style working alone and they're grouped with other people with a similar style. So they're not, they're not going to get as much out of the, uh, the social aspect. And um, they may, may keep very quiet during the, the session. So number five, stop wasting everyone's time. People are busy, so don't waste their time. If you draw up an agenda for the design thinking session and stick to it, that's a really good idea. So you when you're drawing up, the project schedule with key milestones, um, then you would think about how the design thinking activity fits within this broader schedule. And a bad situation is when participants who have already attended a similar event without any meaningful follow-up or actions are in the room. So they, they might bring some baggage or they might slow things down or a whole range of other dynamics that are not conducive to getting the most out of the session. Number six is no wild goose chases. 
So if you have an appropriate agenda with within the allocated time, so if you have half an hour, then you need to design activities that are going to fit comfortably within that time instead of trying to race through and, and do too many things. For example, uh, if you stick to the parameters of the session, the, probably the biggest parameter is, is time, but it, it could there could be other parameters. Um, if you acknowledge new and unexpected and innovative thinking within a sensible lens. So definitely don't discourage uh, innovative thinking, but I guess it, you just need other parameters such as um, something that if, the, if there's a an LMS or a piece of software that you know you're likely to use in the solution, then you bring that up and that can be one of the parameters rather than getting something that's really fabulous and, and great but is not actually workable. So you can encourage creative thought while keeping an eye on irrelevant tangents and unproductive discussions. Again, it's, it's a balancing act. A bad situation is when a design thinking session aims to cover too many complex topics and problems, thus addressing none. So number seven, well, what was all that about? So if you acknowledge and document any key takeaways, realizations, learnings, insights, and next steps, that's a really good thing. Ask the question at the end of the session, what have we learnt? And maybe have a, um, a discussion around the group, around the room. If you discuss and reflect on what's been learned, been learned by the group as a whole and also by the individual participants, that can be a really good thing. A bad situation is when participants are not used to discussing their job role and the value they bring to such a design workshop. So they, they may not be able to link it with their own professional practice, for example. So moving on to number eight, a sensible action plan. This has already come up a couple of times, um, but if you ask the question, what should we do now? And you allocate action items and follow-up plans for participants. You might even schedule a follow-up meeting to regroup and explore the next project milestone. A bad situation related to this is when you have a really effective design workshop with no notes recorded and no follow-up action plan. So it kind of doesn't doesn't have a kind of solid uh, ongoing ring that's useful. Um, it kind of falls a bit flat, in other words. And then it gets back to, well, what's the point? So just wrapping up. So after this presentation, participants will be able to compare a range of design thinking strategies, approaches and activities that are valuable in instructional design and course development. And participants will be able to describe typical obstacles, challenges and potential solutions associated with using design thinking approaches within a collaborative context. So hopefully you are on the way to achieving those. So I would like to thank you very much. Here are my contact details and best wishes for your design thinking workshops.